The French news agency AFP says suspected Codeco militants burned houses and killed at least 24 people Sunday in Ituru province in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. A DRC army spokesman says the dead included one soldier and two militants. The fighting involved fighters from the Cooperative for the Development of the Congo, Kodeko, which represents the Lindu ethnic community, and the Zaire militia, which represents the Hema community. A human rights activist in the area told the AFP that Kodeko fighters launched the attack on the rival Zaire militia as a revenge for the killing of a teacher from the Lendu community. Civil society activists are asking the Zaire group to respect the regional peace process. AFP notes that Kodeko and other armed groups in eastern DRC attended peace talks in Kenya, but Zaire militia members declined to participate. A new UN report says at least 5 million children died before they reached their fifth birthday and another 2.1 million children and youth lost their lives in 2021. But there is some good news in the report. The under-5 mortality rate decreased worldwide by more than a third. Louie Pearson, UNICEF Associate Director of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health, tells VOA's Carol Van Dam that UN humanitarian groups were able to cut the child mortality rate in half from where it was two decades ago. Still, Pearson says, much more needs to be done. Yeah, it is progress, but not enough, right? Even one death is too many. One unnecessary, one preventable death is too many for for the family and for the world. Most of the under five deaths happen in low income countries. And in particular, there are 38 countries experiencing acute humanitarian situations account for the majority of the mortality. These countries include Yemen, and the northern part of Nigeria and the, and the Ethiopia in the past few years and the Somalia and Afghanistan. So these countries need to make um, faster progress if we want to make uh, move the needle of the world. If we use under five mortality reduction as a tracer indicator that many countries But in particular, those countries are lacking progress, needs to move faster. Those countries that you mentioned that include a lot of African countries, there have been conflicts and and intercommunal fighting. Um, Is that the main reason of the child mortality? Also natural disasters, as well as huge public health emergencies. If you look at um, uh, DR Congo, a, a big country, with um, rich natural resources, but it's also a country experiencing what we call multi-pandemic that has, they have, they have had uh, Ebola and COVID-19, cholera, measles, polio outbreaks. So all these health emergencies also affect the delivery of routine health programs, especially at last mile. If you look at the the mortality rate within the country, there there are huge variations in different geographic zones. In the rich urban areas, the mortality rate is much lower than remote rural areas, and the urban poor and areas affected by acute conflict. So what we are looking at is not just the global average or national average, it's really important to look into more a nuanced analysis to understand where exactly within the country that more actions are needed. As you mentioned at the top, the goals have actually, some have been attained that you have reduced significantly the number since 2010. Where do you attribute that to? What, what kinds of, uh, you know, areas that the UN and other groups, uh, humanitarian groups, where did you target your, your efforts that made those numbers come down? So first of all, we need to look at what caused those under, under five mortalities. What killed the children? So these are, half of them are due to newborn complications. Around 50% of the five million happens in the first 28 days. 
this is this newborn period is the most risk for children. They are linked with maternal health, obstetric care, and then pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, TB, HIV, and many other conditions contribute to the majority of them under five deaths. President Cyril Ramaphosa says he will use his chairmanship of the BRICS group of leading emerging economies to focus on advancing African interests. The bloc, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, is seen as an alternative to dominant Western economies. Kate Bartlett speaks to analysts on what form, economically and politically, that might take in this report from Johannesburg, South Africa. South Africa has just taken over the BRICS chairmanship from China and will host the group's annual summit this year, with South African President Cyril Ramaphosa promising more African countries will be invited to attend. We want to use this opportunity to advance the interests of our continent. And we will therefore, through the BRICS summit, be having an outreach uh, process or moment where we will invite other African countries to come and be part of the BRICS. Because we do want BRICS in whatever we, BRICS does, to focus on helping to develop our continent. Our continent was pillaged and ravaged and exploited by other continents. And uh, we, we therefore want to build this solidarity in BRICS to advance the interests, of course, initially of our own country, but also of the continent as a whole. Asked what form advocating for Africa might take, Mikata Kizo Kubai, a researcher at the Pretoria-based research organization, the Institute for Global Dialogue, told VOA it would likely be focused on helping African countries gain greater access to the global economy. He said BRICS is all about allowing the voices of the marginalized to actually be heard and said Africa wants to better the living standards of its people and create employment. The collective size of the BRICS economy, technological capability, market size and other qualities that make BRICS a solid development partner for Africa is what South Africa will look to harness with BRICS partners. I think that is what the president um, was referring to. Elizabeth Sideropoulos of the South African Institute of International Affairs said that trade would be a priority and there would be a focus on unlocking the potential of the recently formed African continental free trade area. She noted that China, the world's second largest economy, is the continent's single largest trade partner. She said the summit is also about getting investment from external partners and sparking intracontinental trade. South Africa would want to uh, to advocate in, in the discussions uh, on these issues uh, with its other BRIC partners, BRICS partners in terms of how we, we use the, uh, the creation of, of a continental free trade area, uh, not only to trade more with uh, the external world, as, but primarily, which is what this initiative is, is really about, uh, to trade, uh, to create goods in the continent that we can trade within the continent. Sideropoulos said aside from trying to advance the economies of developing countries, BRICS is also about reforming the current multilateral system, which does not necessarily advance the interests of the global south. At the last BRICS summit, hosted virtually by Beijing, Ramaphosa took aim at the West, saying that during the COVID-19 pandemic, rich nations did not adhere to the principles of solidarity and cooperation when it comes to equitable access to vaccines. As well as an economic force, BRICS, which includes three democracies, but also communist China and authoritarian Russia, is increasingly a political force that positions itself as an alternative to the US-led liberal world order. Only Brazil voted against Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the United Nations last year, while other members abstained. South Africa, as the continent's foremost democracy, was widely criticized for taking a neutral stance on the conflict. And it looks like BRICS may soon expand. Saudi Arabia is reportedly interested in joining the bloc, as are Iran, Algeria and Argentina. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. 
A World Bank report predicts that inflation and other factors will slow growth in the developing world to less than 2% and to just over 1% for Africa. The yearly Global Economic Prospect report says that that could mean a rise in poverty rates for Africa, which accounts for about 60% of the world's extreme poor. It cites heavy debt burdens and weak investment as global capital is absorbed by advanced economies faced with high government debt and rising interest rates. World Bank Group President David Malpass says the weakness in growth and investment will compound the already devastating reversals in education, health, poverty and infrastructure and the increasing demands from climate change. The World Bank also says 37 states with populations of 1.5 million or less are struggling to revive their tourism sectors hit by a COVID-19 recession. It says in 2020, their economic output fell by more than 11 percent, seven times higher than emerging or developing economies. The bank says small states can improve long-term growth by bolstering resistance to climate change, diversifying their economies, and improving government efficiency. It also calls for global support for climate change adaptation and help restoring debt sustainability. Rights groups say a brutal attack in Zimbabwe's opposition supporters was clearly intended to harass and intimidate ahead of elections expected later this year. Amnesty International called on Zimbabwe to fully investigate a video showing ruling party youth beating and kicking older supporters of the Citizens Coalition for Change. Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare, Zimbabwe. That's a video of some elderly members of Zimbabwe's main opposition party, the Citizens Coalition for Change, being assaulted over the weekend in Murewa, about 100 kilometers east of Harare. The video has gone viral on social media. Fazai Mahere, spokeswoman for the Citizens Coalition for Change, or Triple C, accuses the ruling ZANPF party of masterminding the violence and the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission and the police of failing to stop it. This political violence does not bode well for a free and fair election. In fact, political violence of this nature is criminal. Than that, we call on ZANU-PF to stop inciting violence. We saw the deputy leader of ZANU-PF saying the Triple C must be crushed like lice. Pierre Valley saying that Nelson Chamisa should be killed and Triple C should be killed. So it's that conduct that leads to these terror gangs doing what they do. Chamisa, a former parliament member and cabinet minister, is the 44-year-old leader of the Triple C. In response to an interview request, Tafazwa Mugwadi, Director of Information for ZANPF, sent VOA an audio clip disputing it was his party which caused the violence which injured seven people from the opposition. On his part, ZANPF does not tolerate any form of violence or this barbaric conduct whatsoever. President Mnangagwa has clearly and unequivocally set the record clear on peaceful mobilization and violence-free elections. Whoever commit acts of violence in the name of the party shall carry his or her own cross and account. Let the police do what they know best, investigations. After the video circulated, Zimbabwe police released a statement saying they are investigating the incident. A rights group Amnesty International says it wants Zimbabwean authorities to urgently launch a thorough, independent and impartial investigation into the assaults and bring the perpetrators to justice. Amnesty spokesman in Southern Africa, Robert Sibamgu, said the attacks will intimidate members of political opposition ahead of Zimbabwe's elections and could have a chilling effect throughout the country. These callous, politically motivated attack against older persons who had simply attended a gathering for a political opposition is outrageous. Such cruel acts of violence, which have repeatedly marred Zimbabwe's political landscape in the past, gravely threaten the right to freedom of expression, association and peaceful assembly. The Zimbabwean authorities must take all necessary steps to prevent acts of politically motivated violence 
and refrain from using inflammatory statements that could incite similar attacks or deter people from uh, expressing support to political parties of their choice. Several of Zimbabwe's elections have been marred by violence, most which targeted the opposition. That is why the Zimbabwe Peace Project has set up apps for citizens to report cases of violence or intimidation ahead of the 2023 general election. Tandurele Nkosi Mahaja, the program's coordinator, talks about the organizations reject, resist and report violence up. Gives citizens the ability to report human rights violations from across Zimbabwe, to report those violations and to name and tell us what is happening in, the, in their communities. Urge citizens to use the SPEC application to report violence, particularly as we're coming up to the elections this year in 2023. The Zimbabwe Peace Project hopes the app will reduce cases of violence and intimidation as the country prepares for polls whose date is yet to be announced. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Arare, Zimbabwe. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. On behalf of our producer, Nicole Beckford, and our engineer, Adrius Rigas, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.